Good morning and welcome. The June 6, 2023 meeting of the Transportation and Seattle Public Utilities Committee will come to order. The time is 9.33 a.m. I'm Alex Peterson, Chair of the Committee. Will the Clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Herbolt? Here. Councilmember Morales? Councilmember Sawant? Present. Councilmember Strauss? Chair Peterson? Present. Three present. Thank you. And uh, Council Member Strauss did alert us that, uh, and he will be excused. And I'm, I'm uh, presuming Council Member Morales will join us uh, during the meeting. Um, colleagues, if there's no objection, today's proposed agenda will be adopted. Hearing no objection, the agenda is adopted. Chair's report, just to summarize what we have on our agenda. And good morning again, and welcome to our committee on transportation and Seattle public utilities. We have three items on today's agenda. First, we have an update from the Seattle Department of Transportation on the progress from the property tax levy to move Seattle. Uh, that was approved by voters in 2015 for large transportation uh, projects. Second, we have a briefing discussion and likely vote on Council Bill 120585. This is the final approval for the King County Wastewater term permit in Alki, for which our committee and the council already granted conditional approval unanimously back in February. And for our final item today, we have a council central staff uh, presentation uh, to benefit the general public in large part with an overview of our city's utility tax system, which includes the regressive nature of those utility taxes. Uh, Seattle Public Utilities makes up the bulk of those utility taxes. So um, I'm looking and it looks like we don't have any public speakers. So um, we'll go ahead and open and close the public comment period. This time we're open the general public comment period for the Transportation Seattle Public Utilities Committee, seeing no speakers online and no speakers in person. Uh, we are closing the public comment period for the committee. So that enables us to jump into, I mean, I know you all want me to read the instructions for public comment or do the recording, but I won't <laughs> uh, so that we can move forward. Um, so let's go to item one on our agenda. Uh, will the clerk please read the full title of the first agenda item? Agenda item one, 2015 Levy to Move Seattle Progress Report for briefing and discussion. Thank you. Uh, today we have with us the Seattle Department of Transportation to provide a progress report on what is commonly referred to as Move Seattle. As a reminder for the public, the $930 million property tax levy for that package of transportation projects was approved by voters in November 2015 for nine years. As we approach the end of this levy, we're hearing from SDOT their plans for finishing as many of the promised projects as possible during the next 18 months before the levy expires. So um, I do want to acknowledge Councilman Morales is here and has been here um, toward the beginning. So um, we'll go ahead and hear from SDOT on their presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Council Member Peterson. Um, so I'm Serena Lehman. I work for the Seattle Department of Transportation. And I'm here with my colleague, uh, Kaylin Carney. Um, and we're here to share with you our uh, a progress report on the Levy to Move Seattle for 2022, what we have anticipated for 2023, and then a status update about where we think we're gonna be at the end of the levy. Um, next slide. So just you know, to ground us all in this conversation, SDOT's vision, mission, values, and goals are that we are a thriving equitable community powered by dependable transportation. We're on a mission to deliver trans a transportation system that provides safe and affordable access to places and opportunities. And we are guided by our core values and goals of equity, safety, mobility, sustainability, livability, and excellence. Next slide. So um, as I already touched on, we're going to go through our levy and what we, you know, touch on some key takeaways that if you remember anything from this presentation that we'd like you to take away, um, go through some highlights of both our 2022 annual report, our 2023 delivery plan, and then touch on where we think we're going to be come the end of 2024, and then have ample time for Q&A. Uh, next slide. So our key takeaways are that in 2022, SDOT most of its planned accomplishments for all of our levy deliverables 
we are currently on track to meet or exceed um, 27 of our 30 programs for our 2015 levy ordinance goals. And to, to meet these 27 program commitments, um, we have an ambitious delivery plan for the remaining two years of the levy. Um, 2024 is just, just over 18 months away. Next slide. So um, I want to just have a brief moment to remind everyone of what is in the levy. Um, the levy has 30 programs and it's broken into three different categories. Um, safe routes is our first category and that program encompasses several programs, including um, our Vision Zero program, um, our bike safety program. Um, it also includes things like transportation operations and remark restriping of our, our roads. And then last but not least of that program is our Neighborhood Street Fund program. Um, our second major category is maintenance and repair. And as you can guess, this includes our major paving program, as well as our paving spot program, our bridge repairs, um, as well as uh, tree trimming and tree plantings and stairway rehabilitation. Um, congestion relief is our third and final program. Uh, category, and this is our largest category, and this includes all sorts of different types of programs. It includes things from our, like our transit plus multimodal corridor programs, think um, our Madison project that's under construction right now, but it also includes things like our freight spot program, um, new sidewalks, and um, our East Marginal Way corridor program. Next slide. Okay, so now I'm going to walk through some major highlights from our 2022 annual report. Um, so in 2022, um, in here is just some high level examples, um, but we completed four safety quarter projects, including projects on Lake City Way, 23rd Avenue East, 15th Avenue South and Sandpoint Way. We also completed 16 safe routes to school projects across the city. Um, for the pictures on the right, we want to show some examples of the good work SDOT's doing. Um, at the top, we see some um, sidewalk, safe, sidewalk repair um, from before and after on Aurora Avenue North. And then at the bottom is an example of a pedestrian safety enhancement project on South Del Ridge. Um, next slide. Um, so for our maintenance and repair program, we repaved almost 28 lane miles, including work on 15th Avenue South and 15th Ave Northeast, and exceeded our, pave, our paving spot improvements by over 58% with 103 spot improvements. Um, additionally, we made 354 bridge spot repairs um, we completed six stay, stairway rehabilitation projects, and we planted 371 trees. Um, uh, I wanted to note that part of our, pay, our part of our tree program is that we plant. We worked with the Safe Routes to School program, and we planted trees next to Akikrosi Middle School. Um, this is part of a program that focuses tree plantings on parts of the city where, that are seeing the highest recorded temperatures along routes to school that serve, serve communities of color. Um, and the pictures on the right, you, on the top, you see one of our major paving programs, 15th Avenue Northeast. And on the bottom, we thought this was a fantastic example of kind of what our paving spot program can do. So on the four, this is on Boyer Avenue East. Um, you see, you know, you can see the street and then after SSOC comes in, you can see the nice new pavement. Uh, next slide. Um, and then for our congestion re relief program, we continued major construction on our Madison Ave Rapid, re Rapid Ride G Line, and continued construction on Route 7, Route 44. Um, we also made 23 transit spot improvements um, across the city. An example, one of our transit spot improvements is in the bottom picture to the right. Um, this is on 15th Avenue East in Capitol Hill. This is an enhanced uh, bus stop. Um, and then additionally, we completed six freight projects to help freight movement across the city. And we advertised our East Marginal Way uh, project um, for the North segment, which was very exciting. Uh, next, so now I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, uh, Kaylin Carney to talk about our finances. Uh, Kaylin. All right, thank you, Serena. Um, so this first slide is kind of just a, a high level overview of the spending um, for the Move Seattle levy uh, since inception. Um, so we're seven years into the levy and we spent a total of uh, about $1.3 billion across all fund sources. Um, for Move Seattle levy funds, we've spent $626 million. And so that's a little over uh, two thirds of the $930 million levy. Um, in 2022, we spent $212 million total on the levy portfolio. Um, which is in line with um, the previous four years. Um, and of that $78 million was Move Seattle Levy funds. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, so this slide is showing a summary of our planned expenditures by quarter in 2022, and then our actual spending. Um, in Q1 and in Q2, we underspent relative to our plan, and this was primarily due to two factors. One, the concrete strike, strike which impacted a lot of our projects that are, are reliant on concrete um, delivery. And the other was uh, work on the West Seattle High Bridge reopening um, that shifted prioritization of crews um, to work on those projects and took some capacity away from levy, levy projects. Uh, but in the second half of the year, um, we almost nailed our spend plan exactly in Q3 and came very close in Q4. Um, so overall, we had a we had a pretty good year aside from the um, impacts by the concrete strike and the West Seattle High Bridge. Uh, next slide, please. And this slide just kind of highlights a couple of the programs and um, within the various three categories that had the highest spending amounts. Um, so within our safe rats category, uh, this is our, our sidewalk safety repair or si sidewalk spot repairs, our curb ramps, and then work on the Mel Melrose Promenade um, PBL. In the maintenance and repair category, um, we made significant progress on the South Park drainage project, which is wrapping up this year, um, as well as structures maintenance and um, AMM pavement resurfacing. And then in congestion relief, this is our, our largest category, which houses a lot of the large uh, capital projects. Uh, Madison BRT spent the um, was the project with the highest spending for the year and is also projected to have the highest spending in 2023 as well. Um, and then you can see some of the other multimodal projects, Route 44 and uh, Rapid Ride J. Uh, next slide, please. And now Serena is going to uh, talk about our delivery plan. Great. Thank you so much, Kaylin. Um, so I'm going to walk through, again, some highlights of what we have planned for 2023. Um, there's some additional slides at the back of the deck if we want to get into more detail about what programs are delivering what over the next year. Um, but some key highlights is that uh, we'll be delivering five uh, Vision Zero safety corridors, including projects on First Avenue South, um, Southwest Roxbury and Olson, um, Holden Park Way and Southwest Holden, and um, Rainier Ave. Uh, South Phase 3. We'll also be delivering 9 to 12 Safe Routes to School projects, including projects at Denny Middle School, um, uh, Bailey Gatsert, and uh, Deerborn Park Elementary School. Um, we'll also be continuing construction on projects like Madison Rapid Ride G, but we're going to be completing construction on some projects. So we'll be finishing the Route 7 um, and the Route 44. Um, we will be going to be continuing construction on um, several bridge seismic retrofit projects, including Admiral Way, uh, McGraw Street Bridge, 15th Avenue Northeast, and 15th Avenue Northwest. Um, and then uh, last but not least, we'll also be launching into construction for our East Marginal Way project, which since I've brought this up a couple of times, I'm very excited. I think the department's very excited to start seeing that project take come to fruition. Um, so next slide. Back over to Kaylin. All right, so uh, this is a look at our 2023 spend plan um, broken out by the three major categories. Um, we plan to spend $303 million, and this is across all funding sources, so not just the levy, but also including um, local funds and leverage or grant and partnership funding. Um, and if you remember a couple slides ago, you know, last year we spent 212 million. So this is a big, uh, big increase, a big push towards the, the last couple of years of the levy to get all the projects done. Um, we have a, a couple projects in safe routes, uh, the Pike and Pine PBL, and then our curb ramp programs uh, spends a significant amount of money each year. Um, in maintenance and repair, we have a couple bridge seismic repair projects that are underway. And then in congestion relief, uh, the largest one is Madison BRT again, as that uh, gets towards completion. And then as East Marginal Way starts ramping up. Um, and that's it. Uh, next slide, please. So as Kayla mentioned, we are having a large plan spend for the remaining couple years of the levy. You know, we've been very working very closely with um, our deputy director, Francisca Stefan, and her team to look at to 
look at where we're going to be at the end of the levy. You know, what does success look like? So next slide. So we we believe based on our work planning efforts that we are on track to deliver on 27 of our 30 levy programs that were outlined in the 2015 levy ordinance by the end of 2024. Um, so in this square, you can see all the green are all programs that we're on track to hitting our commitments for the city. And I want to add that we have done that despite a global pandemic, the West Seattle Bridge closure, and the con and a concrete strike that impacted our delivery across the city. Um, and so, uh, you know, we are we are working very hard to meet these goals. You know, we we are very committed to meeting our commitments to the voters. So, next slide. For the programs that we are not currently claiming that we're on track to meet those goals, I want to talk through what that looks like for those three three major categories. Uh, one of them is bicycle safety. In the original 2015 ordinance, we outlined um, building uh, 50 protect miles of protected bike lanes and 60 miles of neighborhood greenways. Um, we believe that we are on track to deliver between 90 and 107, which is going to get us very close to that original 2015 goal. Um, and then for multimodal improvements, this is a very large program within the levy portfolio. Um, this includes 11 discrete projects. Of those 11, we are on track to deliver nine of them. So seven of those are our transit plus multimodal corridor projects. Um, I'm referring to projects like um, our Delridge uh, Rapid Ride Project, Madison, Route 7, Rapid Ride J, et cetera. Um, that also includes a crossing of Northeast 45th and we've recently launched our Aurora planning study. Um, the two projects in this category that are not on track to meeting their original 2015 commitment are the Berkman Trail, which is um, delayed due to ongoing litigation, and then Fauntleroy Boulevard Southwest. Um, this is a project that was outlined in the original 2015 ordinance. And then due to uh, sound transit planning for the West Seattle Ballard Link extension, we paused to allow for that planning process to play out. Um, while we did, however, do some near-term improvements, we didn't. We don't feel like we met the original intent of the levy, so that was paused. And then for the last uh, program that we are, we will not be meeting our meeting our original 2015 deliverable is uh, our light rail connection, uh, Graham Street Station. Uh, we had originally committed uh, funding to support Transcendent Transcendent in doing their infill station on um, the light rail station going the light rail line going through Rainier Valley. Um, however. Uh, Sound Transit is not scheduled to begin that work to till, until after 2025. And so, you know, didn't make sense to kind of move forward with that project when it fell outside the levy timeline. Um, so now I'm going to hand it over to Francisca Stefan to give us a couple closing remarks and then we'll open up for uh, a QA. and a Great. And would it be all right if we get a comment or question from Councilmember Herbold first? Thank you. Go ahead. Thanks so much. Um, yes, I just had a quick question about Fauntleroy. Um, appreciate the uh, historical reference to the reason for the pause. Um, I um, was um, a supportive of the pause. I think I actually may have been um, a person who initiated the conversation about the wisdom of a pause, given the uncertainty about uh, sound transit's route and uh, my concern that uh, about $14 million could be sunk into an area that um, might then have to be torn up in short um, in a short amount of time. And as I think we know, uh, Fauntleroy was the only project in the 20. Uh, 2015 move levy that was fully funded by the levy. So not needing to um, to seek funding from other, other uh, revenue and resources and grant funds in order to, to fully deliver the project. And that was by design um, that it be fully funded by the levy. And so um, when the uh, Pause was agreed to by SDOT um, in exchange for, for that agreement. Um, we received some commitments to, um, to the goals of the project. And um, at the time, uh, SDOT 
said that um, if Sound Transit's light rail design for West Seattle does not impact Fauntleroy Way, Fauntleroy Way, we will move forward with the full project as designed. If Sound Transit's design impacts Fauntleroy Way, we will work with Sound Transit to implement streetscape improvements on Fauntleroy Way that align with the goals of the project and reallocate remaining boulevard uh, project funds to address other mobility needs in West Seattle. So the uh, levy dollars were all stripped from the project during COVID. Then in the summer rebalancing uh, proposal, uh, SDOT recommended uh, the project suspensions um, in 2020, including the Fauntleroy project, the Burke Gilman Trail, and the South Park Drainage Project. Um, this resulted in reducing funding for Fauntleroy by $9 million in restoring funding for the Burke Gilman Trail and the South Park Drainage Project. Um, and I just I just want to figure out how how it is that we can go about um, restoring um, SDOT's not only the sort of policy based and you know, wish list commitment to the project, but also the funding commitment to the project. Um, again, I, I I don't think it can be um, overemphasized uh, the significance of the voters in 2015 uh, voting to allocate 14 million dollars to this project to, in order to fully fund it. I think that says a lot about um, how high of a priority this project was at that time, and and I believe it still is a high priority. Thank you, Councilmember Herbold. Um, we also believe it's an important project and understand um, and really appreciate the thoughtful way that people have allowed us to pivot on that project. Um, it's an important project. It's um, so important that, you know, Director Spots has been out and in the community um, walking that space to, um, to hear from the community about their priorities and what the current needs are. Um, it's something that we do keep on the radar as a commitment that we would like to meet um, and we'd like to find a way to do so. Um, I think at this point it would be, um, it's too early to say where all of those pieces would come from, um, given that we're in the midst of a broader look at a sort of comprehensive funding package, but we have that on our radar as something that needs to be solved for as we move forward into looking at our next year, our upcoming years of capital investment. So um, really do very much appreciate people being flexible as we were as all of us were dealing with changing circumstances and investment and the sound reasoning around not uh, building something and then tearing it back out. Um, and we recognize that there's still a lot of value to that project and we would like to find First of all, work with the community to define current needs and current scope and any tweaks um, and then and then move forward um, through our new transportation funding package um, in, in the upcoming years. So thank you very much for, for helping us um, keep that elevated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Herbold. Um, and I'll continue to support you on that project during the budget process or wherever there are opportunities. Um, wanted to um, uh, talk about just just to start off with some thank yous here. Uh, you know, this is a, with 18 months left in this nine year transportation package. Um, just thinking the the SDOT team, uh, the engineers, uh, all the staff, the workers out in the field who are constructing all these projects. Um, those who are paying the property taxes also to to fund this this measure uh and of course our our oversight committee of volunteers that meet every month in fact there's a meeting tonight uh, i serve on it's an honor to serve on that committee with them uh, i wanted to go through a couple of these slides ask a couple, uh, some questions um the uh, if you could go back to, if we could pull up the the slides again if you don't mind um Let's see, if we go back to slide 15, if you don't mind pulling that up, TMS dot slide 15, that's the 2023 spend plan. Um, so just to confirm, that is, um, those are all funds, not just, so So we can see in the bar chart that um, the levy funds are in green, the all, the rest of the funds are in blue 
and then you've got the combined uh, funding. So when you when you look over to the right side, when it says um, Pike Pine protected bike lane, seven point four million, is that from all sources or is that from just the levy? Are we able to discern that? Yeah, that's um, that's from all sources. Uh, the only okay. separation is in the is in the bar chart. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you very much for clarifying that. And then on slide seventeen uh, about the various um, accomplishments. Thanks for you know highlighting uh, and acknowledging what has not been met, and um, and then also differentiating. You know, there was that twenty eighteen uh, reset, and differentiating that. Um, I do want to question though the bridge seismic improvements um item 12 there um as i had understood it um and i know the goalposts have moved a little bit around this and i think that just for the viewing public to differentiate between what is it that they thought they were approving in 2015 and you know what is it that we're we're trying to honor with implementation um, I think at one point there were 16 bridges that were uh, targeted for seismic improvements. And then there was a letter toward the end of the 2021 where I think SDOT had done some cost updates. And there were a few projects that uh, SDOT had deemed too expensive. And so the list dropped from 16. Uh, well, of that 16, I think there were two that were already done. So the list dropped down to 11 or, or nine. Um, and I think what caught the attention of several council members was the dropping off of the Fremont and Ballard bridges because the price tag seemed still uh, doable. And of course, we provided the uh, $100 million in bonding authority uh, for, for those bridges. Um, so how is it that you're able to say that you've achieved the bridge seismic improvements because I'm I'm not seeing that and but but I think there's some nuance here that you could share with us. Yeah, thanks thanks for asking that question. That's a really important clarification. Um, so uh, yeah, the the I'll go chronologically because it's the easiest way to to think about it for me. It's um, so in the 2015 ordinance, it did uh, make a commitment to 16 um, bridge seismic reinforcement projects. Um, you are absolutely correct that um, in uh, 2020, the, uh, the, that ordinance um, didn't specify specific locations, but over time through the regular annual reporting, um, there developed a list of intended bridge bridges um, that was in annual reports to the LOC and things like that. In the um, fall of 2020, um, a report was taken to the LOC that outlined the um, really increasing costs that include, included first in Argo and fourth in Argo that were over $100 million each. And we were facing some serious challenges there. Um, at the time, the um, LOC um, endorsed a retreat from the total number of bridges. Um, and for uh, a year or so, we worked under the expectation that that was where we would end the levy. Um, as, as we have been reflecting upon um, really wanting to meet our commitment to voters, we have been digging deep to understand where we could still make really meaningful improvements to our bridge asset inventory. Um, we have many, many bridges that need many, many things. Um, and we have, you know, even smaller bridges that are important for safe crossing that cross over major arterials, um, failure of which would be uh, you know, detrimental and potentially tragic for people on top or under should they fail. So there are many, many bridges we need to deal with. So we did pivot as over the last year, looking at where um, we looked at our inventory and need and considered equity distribution as well as sort of um, state of state of the bridge and found that if we really surged resources, we could, uh, we found funding and we found some some capacity to move forward on seismic uh, reinforcement on a number of smaller bridges that we could actually fund um, and get into completion get into construction next year so instead of staying retreated from the total number which I think was at 11 um, we decided that we you know we we need this work done regardless 
And while we couldn't afford some of some of the larger bridges that were on that list, we could afford other really necessary improvements. And so we are um, at this point committing to 16 again um, with a different subset. Um, I will say there remains need for Ballard and Fremont, and we consistently look for ways to continue to improve them. We did find on those. Um, it's not something SDOT typically does because we want to be able to move into construction as soon as design is done. But knowing the need there, we did continue with design on those and fund that so we could be ready um, to, to do that work. So it's a bit of a complex story. Um, it, it has been moving and we've been trying to problem solve, but continually um, keeping our eye on investing on the bridge inventory as best we can. Thank you for that explanation. Um, the last comment I have, and then we'll see if uh, my colleagues have any other comments or questions. Um, you know, in planning for the next uh, transportation package, if if um, uh, in planning for that, we know the Seattle Transportation Plan is the um, the document that uh, will be a foundational piece of assessing uh, needs and getting input from the community on what they would like to see uh, over the next decade. Um, so we're talking a lot about the content of what might go in there. Um, I'm glad that you're doing a variety of outreach in terms of focus groups, but also getting statistically valid information. Uh, recent surveys showed 66% of the top issue for people are actually the road conditions um, that, that affects bikes, buses, um, that may be why it was uh, the top because it's it's a multimodal concern about road conditions. Uh, the second was uh, transit, uh, which was great to see um, a real close second and then bridges were third. Um, so just um, noting that even though we have some things here that have that are checked off as being you know completed via the levy, the 2015 levy, there there's still the conditions out there that when people see them, they're not, they, they may not see that, okay, you met the, the minimum commitment as articulated in 2015, but, but maybe more needs to be done in the future, um, or, or yes, more needs to be done in the future. And that's where what we're not talking a lot about is the funding sources. And, um, you know, we, we uh, the city recently doubled a portion of the property tax toward parks and is planning to do a triple for uh, housing. And we have the the crisis care center, which is a brand new count, countywide tax, uh, veterans and homelessness services is another property tax. Um, so we are hearing from, uh, I mean, I heard this back in 2019 about property tax fatigue, but, and now uh, we're, we're seeing the rates go up with different um, good causes that we're, we're, we're putting, uh, we're requiring property taxes to pay for them consistently. And so that is my segue uh, into um, just encouraging SDOT to look at a variety of funding sources for the next transportation package, uh, which could include uh, transportation impact fees. Uh, we are trying to do lay the groundwork to do that. In seeing how the housing levy was prepared, how much preparation went into that uh, a year before, uh, you know, uh, and so really this, this is the time when you need the authorization, I believe for that funding source that you can actually in January and February, when you're putting together your final package for introduction of the city council for consideration, you have a diversity of funding sources available to you. And so, um, I, I, I know you can't, um, this the this team at SDOT probably can't speak to that issue on funding sources, but it is something that uh, we encourage you to start leaning into. Uh, we have some support for transportation back fees, I know, right here on this committee. Um, so uh, really want to see um, that funding source uh, lifted up as an option. Again, that's something other 70 other cities in the state have this. Um, we we exempt low income housing projects. We exempt child care facilities. We exempt nonprofit uh, buildings. Um, so um, I guess that's not I, that's not a question. That's a that's a little speech. Um, so uh, do we have any other uh, comments or questions from from committee members? Um. All right. 
Oh yes, Councilmember Herbold. Sorry, I was raising my real hand instead of my virtual hand. <laughs> um, yeah, just to uh, um, add on to Councilmember Peterson's comments around um, transportation impact fees, um, we've heard uh, from um, some community stakeholders in the development community that they um, really want us to wait until the process of developing the transportation levy uh, to, to talk about transportation impact fees. And I think the um, the message that I've been trying to uh, to push out there is, yes, we, we, we can wait and we should wait uh, to talk about the development of the program itself, but we can't even do that until we take this first procedural step of updating the comp plan. So, um, we can't wait to update the comp plan, but we can and should wait until we have the conversations around the transportation levy um, when it comes to actually uh, talking about the, the the size of the fee um, and establishing uh, a program and, and and just having that conversation um, about the trade-offs around around establishing a program. But again, uh, what we're what we're seeking to do right now is merely a procedural step that would allow us to have those later conversations. The other um, question I wanted to ask is, back uh, before uh, before COVID, I was working um, with SDOT on developing levy specific. I'm sorry, district specific levy accomplishments. And um, we had uh, worked with SDOT to develop sort of a prototype um, report for uh, was for District One, but the idea was is it would be replicated for other districts, and it would be included in future um, annual levy reports. And um, the the district specific report itself covers a different a number of different. Um, projects uh, by by project type um, says you know when what year it was completed um, and it's as far as the project types it's broken up by safety corridors safe routes to schools bicycle safety um, neighborhood street fund stairway maintenance um, multimodal improvements and sidewalks and I just was really excited about um, being able to to use this to share with my constituents um, how much amazing work is was being done with this levy, and I'm wondering, um, are we still uh, using that format to to report out levy accomplishments? Um, I, again, I, I recognize that it was something that um, SDOT was uh, sort of beginning to launch in in late 2019 with the goal of um, these types of reports being in the annual um, the annual reports, but just I, I don't recall seeing um, the use of this kind of uh, reporting out since that time and just wondering where that's at. I don't know that we've done that recently. Um, it's something we could take another look at. It's been a few years, so we could revisit that. Um, that and what it would take to, you know, package the information in in that way. Um, I think there's some some value to it, and we could definitely take a take a look. Um, so thanks. And and to the the point of the long term funding package, we too um, are very interested in having a robust and diverse funding package. So um, we are eager to look at ways that we can continue to be creative and and create revenue streams that help us deliver uh, important projects for the. For the city and and the community that just really keep us moving, um, and you know we've we've really one thing that we often don't celebrate enough is the way in which the levy has enabled us to compete for state, federal, and partner funds. Um, you know we are at a point where you know we've had the nine hundred and thirty million dollars of levy that's almost been one to one matched. Um, with those other funds. So I think um, just a, an important note that as we think about diversity of funding sources and keeping all the options on the table that we remember that, you know, some of the things have really, we've we've actually done incredibly well to bring in support from other places um, to, to leverage to deliver for the, the citizens of Seattle. So uh, appreciate that. And we'll take a look at that reporting that you're asking about. I just sent you a copy from uh, past years. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. 
Thank you, colleagues. Any other comments or questions about this progress report on the Move Seattle levy? All right, well, thank you to the SDOT team and we'll go ahead and move to the next item on our agenda. Thank you, bye. Okay, will the clerk please read the short title of the second agenda item into the record. Agenda item two, Council Bill 120585, an ordinance granting King County Department of Natural Resources and Parks Wastewater Treatment Division permission to construct, maintain, and operate a transformer and retaining wall at 63rd Avenue Southwest for briefing discussion and possible vote. Thank you. As I mentioned earlier, our committee recently saw this item in February, and we unanimously granted conditional approval to King County for the term permit via resolution 32079. Uh, SDOT is back to confirm that uh, they have met or will meet the conditions outlined in Resolution 32079 so that we may now approve the related council bill. Uh, before I turn it over to the presenters, I wanted to thank Lish Whitson from our Council Central staff for his review and memos regarding this item. Lish, do you have any opening comments for us? Uh, I think you covered everything I was going to say, so thank you. You're welcome. All right, well, let's go ahead and turn it over to our presenters. Good morning. Good morning, council members. Uh, this is Amy Gray and I work at SDOT and I have Zach from King County in this meeting as well um, to answer any questions specifically about the overall project. And, and Amy, could you uh, speak up a little bit or turn up your volume? Thank you. Is this better? Um, if you could just speak up some more. All right. Thank you for uh, having me here today. <laughs> it's been a challenging technological pro uh, morning. So uh, like council member said, council member Peterson said, we're here uh, regarding the transformer ordinance. Next slide, please. King County is seeking the final approval uh, for the transformer and retaining wall at 63rd Avenue Southwest as it intersects with Beach Drive Southwest and Southwest Spokane Street. The transformer is necessary um, to support the permanent standby generator at the Alki Wet Weather Treatment Facility and the 63rd Avenue Pump Station. King County is uh, conducting a larger environmental project and um, to provide permanent backup generator power to the wet weather treatment facility and the pump station. And these transformers are necessary to uh, allow that to happen and prevent um, untreated wastewater being discharged into Puget Sound. SDOT, uh, so significant structures uh, require council approval. There are structures that, need to, that will be in the right of way for a long duration. Um, there are structures that impede the city or the public's flexibility in the use of the right of way and are necessary for the functioning of the facility. And this project meets all three of those criteria. Next slide, please. Uh, term permits are approved in two steps. We each used step one in February when council provided conceptual approval via the resolution 32079. And we are here at step two, the passage of the ordinance. Uh, the ordinance will grant permission to use and occupy for the long-term right-of-way and it details all the terms and conditions of Fort King County to construct and operate the transformer and retaining wall. Next slide, please. So King County is proposing to do this, um, as I mentioned, to uh, help support the, the high capacity standby generator. Um, and it is needed to regulate the voltage between the two facilities. There will be a transformer located on King County's property at the wet weather treatment facility to the west and the transformer adjacent to 63rd Avenue pump station. Um, the pump station is currently all in right of way and King County does not own any property adjacent to it. So uh, there's no other feasible location for it to be um, except within the right of way. It will be approximately six feet high and nine feet wide, and it will uh, occupy approximately 300 square feet in the right of way. We'll know exactly what these dimensions will be after um, King County signs the contract with the contractor and the contractor gets the, gets the specifications for the exact transformer that uh, they will be installing. Um, the term for this permit is unlimited. This is, uh, this is similar to other King County permits we have um, with similar facilities for as long as King County operates the wet weather treatment facility and the pump station, um, the permit is valid. And then um, if they ever stop those operations and the permit would be uh, revoked. 
SDOT is also coordinating with King County to minimize uh, construction disruptions to the neighbors um, with as it relates to the Healthy Streets project at South Beach, uh, Beach Drive Southwest. The city and King County are currently working on a fee in lieu agreement to uh, so that there will be temporary restoration by King County of the right of way. And then when um, SDOT does the improvements for the healthy street that uh, they will fin they will finalize that um, using the fee in lieu agreement. This will uh, allow the street to not be torn up twice and having a huge investment um, for nothing. Uh, next slide, please. This is a larger map of West Seattle showing the approximate location of the transformer. Next slide, please. Uh, this, these are more uh, focused shots. Uh, the slide on the left shows the, the wet weather treatment facility to the west and the trenching and the underground work that will happen in the right of way and then the location of the pump station. And the slide on the right shows uh, a more detailed location of where the rat transformer will be um, adjacent to the pump station. Next slide. So this is the existing conditions on the site. Um, it's, uh, there is a current retaining wall that will remain um, and uh, the existing vegetation. Next slide. The, uh, we had King County uh, develop these images to show what the transformer would look like. Um, after the project's completed, you can see on the far left, it's looking out towards the beach. Um, the middle slide shows uh, the retaining wall necessary to support the transformer. And the last slide on the right shows it looking up towards the right of way. Next slide. King County is going to be doing uh, enhanced landscaping with native species. It's uh, They've got a pretty detailed plan that they're working on to provide uh, native plants and um, make it as green as possible. They are also planning to screen the transformer as much as possible with the landscaping and have it blend in um, so it's not just a large structure um, just out by itself. Next slide. Uh, King County conducted public outreach um, in May 2019. They posted in the West Seattle blog uh, an early heads up about the overall project of the, you know, doing the transformer and the work that it would involve in the right of way. In March 2022, they sent flyers to the neighborhood uh, about the overall projects, more specific to their location of where of the impact to those neighbors. And in September 2022, we asked King County to send a follow-up flyer that specifically called out that the transformer would remain after the construction project uh, was complete. We didn't want that to get lost um, in the overall message of the larger project. Next slide, please. So uh, King County is here seeking passage of this council bill for, council bill for final approval. And if the ordinance is approved, the permit, uh, like I mentioned, will be in place for as long as King County operates the facilities um, in at the wet weather treatment facility and the Alki pump station. And that's the end of my presentation. Any questions? Thank you very much. And we appreciate uh, King County uh, Wastewater Treatment Division being here today. Um, is there anything, Zach, that you wanted to add? Uh, the, thank you, Council Member. No, I, uh, Amy uh, covered everything. Thanks, Amy. Okay, thank you. And um, again, colleagues, I uh, want to thank Lish Whitson for his memo, which is attached to the agenda. Um, and Council Member Herbold, please. Thank you. I um, want to just thank um, King County and Estot for working together on this project. Really appreciate um, the commitment to making sure that um, the impacts of this project are, are managed, um, including the commitment of keeping um, one lane of traffic open during the work. The uh, criteria for review in the municipal code for a significant structure proposal um, aren't only the potential impact to uh, view blockage, which I think you addressed really well, but also the effect on pedestrian activity um, pedestrian safety um, and accessibility for the elderly and handicapped. I'm wondering if you could describe um, a little bit of 
how the county is working to address those items as well. Um, th th thank you for the question, uh, council member. Um, we, uh, as, as the project begins, we are doing a targeted uh, outreach in any section of what we're working on. So if, if we are communicating with the community, uh, working along with the, uh, with the city, especially with the um, Health Street Initiative uh, program, um, so if there are any uh, group of uh, example, the one that you've mentioned, um, we will coordinate and make sure that, um, you know, th their uh, concerns are addressed. So I think I hear you saying that um, you'll work on mitigation of pedestrian safety impacts. Um, should you become aware of them? It's not a, um, should you become aware of them through outreach? It's not something that you're proactively um, doing or, or or maybe you haven't identified that there we, are we, pedestrian we impacts engaged. and that's okay too. <laughs> uh, no, Councilman, we have already engaged a traffic control. So we, we have a uh, extensive um, uh, mitigation program when it comes to pedestrian and, and walkability. Um, so it, it's already ingrained and we could provide more additional information. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Council Member. Colleagues, any other comments or questions? Uh, Lish, did you want to add anything? No, thank you. Okay. As I had read your memo, it seemed to confirm basically the presentation we, we got today. So they, they're sort of aligned, um, which is nice uh, to, to see. Um, well, colleagues, um, this is something since we did approve the resolution before in February, conditionally approving this, we're, we're familiar with the project. Um, or the district council member here who's um, gotten her questions and comments in. So I feel comfortable voting on this today uh, so that we can move it forward for SDOT and King County. Okay. So let's go ahead and do the parliamentary procedure to consider this officially. Uh, council members, I now move that the committee recommend passage of Council Bill 120585, item two on our agenda. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded to recommend passage of this council bill. Are there any final comments or questions before we vote? All right. Will the clerk please call the roll on the committee recommendation to pass the council bill? Council Member Herbold? Yes. Council Member Morales? Yes. Council Member Sawant? Yes. Chair Peterson? Yes. Four in favor, none opposed. Thank you. The motion carries in the committee recommendation to pass the council bill will be sent to the June 13th city council meeting. Thank you to Zach and Amy and Lish. Thank you very much. All right. Well, we'll go ahead to the third and final item on our agenda. Will the clerk please read that full title of the third agenda item into the record? Agenda item three, Utility Taxes 101 for briefing and discussion. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, with Seattle Public Utilities paying by far the largest share of utility taxes to, the, to City Hall, to the city's general fund, I've asked central staff to provide this committee uh, with a utility taxes presentation. The intent is to enhance the understanding and transparency for the general public about these charges that impact everyone's utility bills. And they are regressive with lower income residents paying a greater portion of their household income toward these uh, utility bills. And in particular, the taxes that we charge on top of the actual cost to provide the services. So while these utility taxes are authorized by state law, they do go above and beyond the actual cost of, uh, for example, providing the drinking water. Um, and because utility, utility bills have been increasing per our rate path uh, and they're regressive, we just wanna shed additional light for the general public on how utility taxes work. And so um, appreciate central staff putting this a uh, quick presentation together. Um, thank you, Calvin Chow, for standing in for Brian Goodnight, who also worked on this. Welcome. 
Good morning, Council Members. Uh, thank you, Chair Peterson. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, at your request, we put together this presentation. I'd also want to um, acknowledge Eric McConaughey, who helped provide this material. Um, I wanted to start with an overview of utility taxes. And just to uh, start, that utility taxes are a form of business and occupation tax. And fundamentally, this is a tax on the operation of the business that is recouped through the utilities rates and charges. And the utility taxes are paid by both public and private utilities, which include both telecom, natural gas, steam, and other utilities, and our two public utilities, which is the focus of this presentation. So for Seattle Public Utilities, that is drainage, solid waste, wastewater, and water. And for Seattle City Light, that is electricity. As I mentioned, uh, utility taxes are imposed on the utilities business operations within the city's jurisdictional boundaries. And some utility taxes are capped by state law, such as the tax on electricity, which the state limits to 6%, while there are no prescribed tax limits for drainage, solid waste, wastewater, or water. Uh, the taxes are levied on the retail business of the utility, which means that um, revenues such as wholesale revenue uh, are not subject to the tax. The utility tax applies to all business activity, both within and outside the city limits, because it is on the, the business operations as a whole. And so, for instance, both Seattle Public Utilities and Seattle City Light provide service to some Burien customers. The city's utility taxes apply equally to the retail revenues from both Burien and Seattle customers. I note that other jurisdictions can also impose similar taxes or fees, and those are collected only on the customers within their jurisdictions. So here are the current utility rates. Um, electricity, as you can see, is capped at 6% and was last adjusted in 1990. The Seattle Public Utility tax rates vary between 11.5% and 15.5%, with the most recent adjustment for solid waste in 2017. And this slide shows the contributions of the utility taxes to the general fund for 2023. Uh, in the top left, you'll see that public and private utilities are estimated to bring in about 232 million or 14% of the city's general fund this year. And then lastly, I have a slide here showing the breakdown of public utility contributions to the general fund. Uh, CLC Light will generate about 60 million in 2023, drainage and wastewater from SPU about 65 million, solid waste about 24 million, and water about 37 million. And that's the last slide I have prepared and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, Calvin, could you go back to the previous slide? Just so that's on, the, yeah, that one. Okay, thank you. Colleagues, are there any comments or questions about this? Um, we know, I know you all are familiar with this, uh, just for the viewing public to know that uh, this is a revenue source for the general fund. We are uh, literally taxing our, our, our other partner agency here, Seattle Public Utilities and Seattle City Light, um, and that money is flowing into the general fund. So it's just important to know when people get their utility bills and they do see those taxes above the cost of the services provided that it, it does have a real impact. Um, so we just want to be, I want to be more transparent about that as we start gearing up for budget season. All right. Well, seeing no comments or questions, want to thank central staff for that. That's going to be a very useful document as we go forward here. Um, and that was the third and final item on our agenda today. So if there is nothing further for our committee today, uh, colleagues, the time is now 1031 a.m. And this concludes the June 6, 2023 meeting of the Transportation and Seattle Public Utilities Committee. Uh, the next committee meeting of the Transportation and Seattle Public Utilities Committee will be Tuesday, June 20th. I want to thank you and we are adjourned. <laughs>